learn hand chimes. Too. Then I get to learn hand chimes. Hallelujah. <laughs> Just because I sing and I know that notes go up this way and down this way, you know, they go up and down and that there's some meters and all that, they think I'm qualified to play hand bells, which um, my kids love to watch me because they say, all you do is stand there going, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. That's all right. It gets the job done, that's all I can. So if you can count, we would love to have you come and take my place next year if, uh, if, if the Lord moves upon your heart to do that. Um, take your Bibles uh, with me, if you will, to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. We've been, uh, we've been studying probably for about a year, maybe a year and a half, uh, the epistle uh, to Ephesians. Ephesians is a great little book. It's a book that uh, every Christian should read. It's a book that uh, really teaches us uh, how to walk with the Lord. Um, I love, uh, I love the, the, the latter three chapters, uh, chapters, three, uh, chapters 4, 5, and 6, just because it is a very practical book for us as believers. Um, verse, chapters 1, 2, and 3 is all doctrine. It's all it's talking about what God has done for us and what He's doing for us. and um, It talks about our salvation, and there's some really great doctrines in that. Um, but, uh, but we find that uh, uh, the, the Lord you know, tells us now uh, in chapter 6 that we, now we need to stand. Um, as, uh, as Christians, uh, there's a responsibility for us to stand and to stand firm in, what, uh, in who we are. Um, if you are here today and you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Word of God tells us that, uh, that you are a Christian. You know, it's interesting, yesterday on the way home from, I think it was on the way home from the conference I was at, we were talking in the car, and, um, you know, we were talking about being a Christian. And I hope you understand that the term Christian was not invented by Christ. It was invented by the world. The world looked at, um, looked at people, at us, at those who followed Jesus Christ, and would say in a, uh, in a, um, in a, in a way that put them down. Look, there's a little follower of Christ. There's a little Christian. Okay, or there's a little Christ. And in, in, um, in Acts chapter 11, I think it is, it's the first account where the, where the followers of Christ were called little Christ. They were, they were followers of Christ. Why? Why did the world call them followers of Christ? Because they walked with Christ. Because they imitated what Jesus Christ did. Because they lived the way that they were supposed to do. And so, if you're here today and you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Word of God says you have a lifestyle that you need to live within the world that is falling apart. You know, I, I, I feel for the younger generation. You know, when I was growing up, it sounds like I'm real old, I'm not that old, but... When I was growing up, you know, we hear that from all of our old people. You know, when I was growing up, we used to walk uphill to school both ways in the snow as deep as our knees. I've heard that story for years. You know, but the reality is, you know, when, when uh, the older I get, the more I feel for those who are coming behind me. Because our society is changing dramatically. You know, between the between the, um, the, the, the lifestyle changes, you know, and you know something, um, all of that is based on sin. If it be life, different lifestyle, different, you know, gender identity, if it be all these movements that, that we find, all of their, those things are based in sin. And, you know, the reality of it is this. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you know it's sin, therefore you're not participating in it. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you think it's all right. The problem that I have is today is, is that the world is starting to come down on us as Christians. The, the, the world is starting to attack us. The world is starting to say, look, those people, they're a bunch of, uh, they're, they're, they're a bunch of, uh, uh, of, of, of haters of everybody else. I want us to say, I want to say this and I want everybody to hear it. If it be here in this sanctuary or online or wherever you are, I want you to know that here at North Chester Baptist Church under Randy Friedman as pastor, we're not going to hate the gay and lesbians. We're going to love them. We're not going to hate the transgenders. We're going to love them. Why? Because the word of God says we need to love the sinner. 
That's our responsibility. Why? Because while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He loved us when we didn't deserve. We need to do the same thing. I say that because with the world changing, it's so easy for us to allow our standards to go from this is what God wants for us and to say, well, okay, I'll give a little bit. 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 And so our standards have changed. Now, don't get me wrong. There are some things we used to do 80 years ago that probably we shouldn't be doing. I don't know if you've ever seen those shows where 80 years ago, you know, pictures of people on the beach where, you know, they would have the, the, the men would have these long, you know, one-piece bathing suit on from the neck all the way down to the ankles. You know, I, I don't think that's necessary. But I don't think we should also participate in some of those, some of the scenes we find on the beaches today. Okay, there's a balance there. And the Word of God tells us that we as God's children have to stand. And that's where we've been at here in Ephesians chapter 6. Look at your Bibles, if you will, and we're going to just see some of this real quick. In, in verse 10, it tells us this. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. The emphasis in this text that we've been studying, the armor of God, is to be strong. How can we be strong? Notice what it says there in verse... Uh, um, there in verse... Uh, in verse... Um, in verse 14. In verse 14, again, he emphasizes, stand therefore. Okay? So the emphasis of this text is to stand on Jesus Christ and on His Word. We have a responsibility to take our stand and not to move. We're not going to be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. We're not going to listen to these preachers that are preaching it. You know, there's a lot of preachers out there. They sound real good for 90% of, of their teaching, but there's still 5%, maybe 1%. Listen, if 1% of their teaching is wrong, their whole teaching is wrong. I, told, I taught my kids and I taught the youth group in this church that, you know something, if it's not 100% true, then it's a lie. And that's the reality of it. You and I need to take a stand. And we need to stand on truth. He goes on and tells us how to do that. Put on the whole armor of God. He says put on the, the, the helmet and the, and the, uh, the, 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 the breastplate and the, the, the belt and the shoes. And, uh, you know, put on the, um, put on the, 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 you know, take the shield of faith, you know, to protect you. Pick up the sword of the spirit. That's what we looked at last week. He says why? So you can defend yourself against the attack. And, and it's interesting, in our text, you know, in, I think it's in verse, uh, in verse 11, and 11 and 13, it talks about the, the wiles of the devil, being able to withstand uh, in the evil day in verse 13. You know, we're supposed to be able to stand against the things that the, Satan is going to throw our way. And listen, we live in a society today that Satan is throwing everything he can at us. He really is. My question to you is, are you standing? Paul tells us how. Put on the armor of God. Take up the sword of the Spirit. And then there's one last thing he tells us to do. He says pray. Notice that in verse 18. That's our text today. In verse 18 it says this. Pray always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end. To what end? To the end of standing. Again, the emphasis here is to stand. Okay, being, watch, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints and for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mysteries of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Lord, help us to stand. Let's open with a word of prayer, and then we're going to look at this text here in a little more detail. Father, thank you. Thank you for the privilege of studying your word today. Lord, open our minds, open our hearts, that we may hear what you have to say, but Lord, we may do more than hear, that we would apply it to our lives. Lord, change us today. Moses went before the presence of God and uh, and, and he saw he saw actually the back of God, and he was transformed. So as we come before your throne today, transform us. That we may leave here differently than when we came in. Lord, I do thank you. 
In Christ Jesus' name, amen. One of the authors that I read uh, with regards to study is Warren Wiersbe. And Warren Wiersbe in his um, expository outlines of the New Testament, um, in, in his uh, study on Ephesians, he writes this. He says, armors and weapons are not sufficient to win a battle. There must be energy to do the job. Our energy comes from prayer. He goes on, he says this, we use the sword of the Spirit and we pray in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit empowers us to win the battle. Then he challenges us to read chapter 3 in verses 14 through 21, and uh, I'm not going to do that this morning. But this idea here is that if we're going to be able to withstand the things that the devil's going to throw our way, we need to pick up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and we need to stand in prayer. And Paul then goes on and he talks about this idea of prayer. We talked about it this morning in Sunday school a little bit, but I want to give you, uh, I want to give you several things with regards to, um, to prayer here today. The first thing we see in this text, okay, first thing we see in this text is the command. Look what it says there, there in our text. We find the command to pray. Notice what it says in verse 18. It says, praying always. That's the command. We're, we're commanded to stand. We're commanded to pray. We're not going to be able to, to stand if we don't pray. You know, they go hand in hand. And uh, we as God's children have to learn and have to understand that God gives us this command. Notice what else he says in this text. In this text he says, pray always. I think the, uh, I think the second thing we need to understand is the frequency of prayer. There's a frequency of prayer. How often do you pray? How often do you take, you know, we, we always grow up three times, three times a day we pray plus at night time before going to bed. We pray four times a day. That's all the Word of God teaches. The Word of God it doesn't say, well, when you have breakfast, pray. The Word of God doesn't say when you have lunch, pray. When you have dinner, pray. And then when you go to bed, pray. No, that's not what it says. The Word of God says pray always. The frequency of prayer is always. God wants us to continually be in the mindset of prayer. You know, prayer is talking with God. And we, He wants us to constantly be talking to God. Listen, God is our Heavenly Father. In Romans chapter 8, we're told that we call our Heavenly Father, we call Him Daddy. There you go. We call Him Father. You know, we need to understand that just like my kids talk to me and I talk to my kids or my wife talks to me and I talk to my wife, we need to be talking with God this way like we do talk with people this way. And if we stop talking, then problems come. I always know when there's problems in my household, it's because 90% of the time communication is stopped. I counsel young couples when I do premarital counseling. I counsel young couples that there's, uh, that there's two things that will, that will hurt the marriage more than anything else. Number one is finances. How do you deal with finances? You know, money will destroy anything. But number two is communication. If you don't communicate, if you don't talk, and I think that's why... Paul wrote earlier in this in, in chapter 4, I think it is, maybe chapter 3. He says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. You know, as people, if we allow the sun to go down on our anger without dealing with it first, it's going to be worse the next day. No, I'll, 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 I'll go to bed on it, I'll sleep on it in the morning, I'll wake up. Let me tell you something. Number one, you won't get a good night's sleep. But number two, you'll wake up and that problem hasn't gone away. And it won't go away until you go face to face with that person and you deal with it. The Bible is a guide for our lives. And it's interesting. The Word of God says if a brother has something against you, you go to that brother. It's, it's interesting. The Word of God says before you put the offering in the offering basket. And you know that you have a, a brother against you. Go to that brother first before you offer the sacrifice. Before you give you know, there's this, this need of communication. The need of communication has to be there between us and God. And it needs to be done 
Always. There are many Bible verses we find in Scripture. Luke chapter 21 and verse 37 says, Watch therefore and pray, what? Always. Always. Not sometimes. Not if you're feeling good. Not if you're awake. Not if you didn't have time. The Word of God says always. Notice what it says in Acts chapter 2 and verse uh, in verse 42, it says, end day. We're talking about the early church here. This is the, the place where Peter just, just preached the message and 3,000 3, souls were saved. And it says, they, those souls continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking of bread. And notice what that last, last few words are. And in prayers. They continued steadfastly in prayers is what the Word of God said. The Word of God also tells us in Psalm 55 and verse 17, it tells us evening and morning and at noon I will pray. Do you realize that the, on the Jewish calendar a day starts in the evening? It starts from sundown to sundown. Their evening is our morning. And I think what the psalmist is saying here is it doesn't matter what time of day it is. It doesn't matter if it's in the morning or at night. It doesn't matter if it's in the middle of the day. He says, I'm going to always cry out to you, Lord. I'm going to talk to you. My friends, we need to always, the frequency of prayer is this, this idea of always talking. Um, why, why, do we, why do we cry out to the Lord? What's, how do we do that? How, do we, you know, how, how, how is it possible to constantly be, be on our knees praying? And the answer is we can't. But Paul gives us a glimpse of how we do that. There in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 2. He says this, set your mind on things above, not on things of earth. See, our mindset, our values, our priorities have to be heavenly, not earthly. We have to be focused on those things of heaven. My friends, where's your focus today? You know, I, I think sometimes we focus on politics. You know, I, I think as Christians, you know, I really don't care about politics. I don't listen to the news. I don't like what listening. You know, I will not let any of our politicians put any signs around the church or on the church property. I won't allow any of that. You know why? Because we're not here to do politics. Amen. We're here to preach Jesus Christ. Our focus has to be on Him and on eternity, not on what's going on here on earth. Why? Because this world will fade away. This world will pass away. We will not. When, I, when we give up life, when we stop breathing, if we know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, the Lord has promised that there's a place waiting for us in heaven. He has promised the mansion that He's preparing for us. That's what the Word of God says. And guess what? Soon and very soon, we're going to see the king. Soon and very soon. You know, one day he's coming back in the clouds. He's going to call us home. He's going to say, forget it now with this world. I've given, them, I've given them the last chance. And I'm going to remove the church. And I'm going to judge the world. And judge Israel. We find that, uh, we, we find that that time is coming soon. But you know, you and I need to be focused what? Our minds on heavenly things. You know, we're worried about handbells and we're worried about, you know, chimes and we're worried about, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the building and we're worried about material things. We're worried about our car. Well, my car might not get me from here to there. And we're worried about our health and we're worried about all these kind of things. Where's your focus today? You know something? None of those things really matter. They really don't. <gasps> Pastor, you just offended me. My, my, my life doesn't matter. I'm not here to offend you. I'm here to tell you that Jesus Christ tells you your life really doesn't matter. Because what matters is the heavenly things, the things we store up in heaven, not the things of earth. We're very busy at, at getting, getting the things of earth. We're very busy at making sure everything's immaculate. Where is your focus today? Our focus has to be on heavenly things. That's why Paul says, listen, when you go to battle, when you're standing against the devil, if you're going to stand, if you're going to stand firm and not move, you need to be praying. Because prayer is what's going to keep your focus in the right place. Go back to our text, if you will. Not only do we, uh, not only do we find 
Um, we find the frequency of prayer, but we find the variety of prayer. There is a variety of prayer that we need to understand. God doesn't, the God doesn't just say, well, uh, you know, here, just pray. It's interesting in our text, look what it says there in verse, uh, verse 18. It says, praying always, and then he gives two examples of prayer. He says, with all prayer and supplication. Some translations might have petitions in there. But the, the, the idea here is, and if you, if you look at other passages of Scripture, you find that there's all, you know, there are different terms, petitions. Um, you know, what is it in, uh, in Philippians chapter 4? It says, be anxious for nothing but by every prayer and supplication, let your re- uh, and, and with thanksgiving, let your request, the term request is made, is made known. Uh, you know, there are other terms that's used, but it's interesting, Paul uses these two Greek words in this text. I went on as I was studying uh, this past week, I went on and I typed into the internet, I said, how many different types of prayers are there? Prayers in the Bible. This is a list that they gave me. I'm just going to read it real quick. There's the prayer of adoration. Psalms 148 in verse 13. And that's just the prayer of worshiping God. There's the prayer of thanksgiving. Giving thanks to God. 1 Chronicles chapter 16 verses 34 and 35. There's the prayer of confession. When we acknowledge our sin. Lord, I have sinned. We find that in Psalm 32 in verse 5. There's a prayer of vows. You remember Hannah when she when she went, she was wanting a child, and she went and she prayed in the uh, in the uh, in the tabernacle, I guess, at that time, and um, and she she prayed and said, Lord, if you give me a son, I promise I will give you that son back. And remember, God honored that vow that she had made. There's a prayer of vows. You know, we also find in Scripture, we find the prayer of quiet reflection. Sometimes our prayer life is just, just quietly listening to God. You still know that I am God. Sometimes that, that reflection is just looking and remembering what God has done for us and, and, and quietly, you know, just reflecting on that, which then leads to praise and adoration. But there's that, that, that time of reflection. There's also a prayer of healing. Lord, heal me. Jeremiah 17, verse 14. Jeremiah cried out, uh, heal, heal me, O Lord, and I will be healed. There's a prayer of deliverance and help. We find uh, we find many times David crying out, Lord, Lord, deliver me. Lord, help me. There's a prayer of intercession where we pray for others and, uh, and we pray for their needs. There's also a pray, prayer of transformation. You know, we as, we as we walk with the Lord and as we go to the Lord in prayer, we need to be asking the Lord, Lord, change me. Lord, make me new. Lord, renew my heart and, and make me new. There needs to be that, that, that transformation in our life. Listen, if you're walking with the Lord, you ought to be growing in the Lord. And if you're growing in the Lord, you ought not to be the same today as you were last year. There has to be a change. Why? Because the Word of God tells us that when we're in Christ, we're new creatures. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. There's also a prayer of blessing. You know, just thanking the Lord and, and um, you know, um, the, the, just, just blessing the Lord. There's a prayer of blessing. We could probably go on. There's probably, there's probably others, but the, the idea here is that there's a variety of there's a variety of ways to pray. Why did Paul, in our text here, give us these two words, prayer, uh, prayer and supplication? The word prayer in the Greek is talking about and has the idea of a general term. It's a general term used. And it's talking about a general prayer. There are many times when we pray, we pray in a general way. Lord, bless the church. It's a general, you know, it's a general prayer. The term supplication here implies, okay, a specific prayer. I believe that in our prayer lives, we need to have general prayers, but we also need to be specific with the Lord. 
You know, sometimes we pray things and we're not specific enough and God gives us what we prayed for and then we look at what He gave us and we say, Lord, that's not really what I wanted. <laughs> well, can you pray specifically for what you want? I remember, I remember my parents when they went out to the mission field and my parents, you know, their mission at that point did not allow them to buy a house. Okay, they were Americans, they weren't allowed to buy a house in France. So they had to rent. And I remember my sisters telling my, uh, my parents, and they said, you know, Mom, um, uh, we, we, as, as, you find, as you're looking for a house, we want a lot light, 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 light up tree out front. And, um, and my parents said, well, we're not sure if we can find that, but, you know, we'll start praying about it. Okay, as they went and, and looked at houses, they came to one house, and it had this, this big lilac bush in the front of the house. And my sister says, that's the one. That's the one. You know, you know we, we as brothers, we always make fun of my sisters for doing that. But the reality is, when you go to the Lord in prayer, go specifically. Ask for what the desires of your hearts are. Okay? God might meet those desires of your heart. Sometimes I believe God doesn't answer our prayers. It's because we're not specific enough. We're too general. Well, you know, Lord, I, you know, I, I, and I can't even think of an example. But you know, we we tend to get too general in uh, in that uh, in that prayer. So we need to understand that there is a variety of prayers. In First Timothy, chapter two and verse one, the Word of God tells us this. Therefore, I exhort first of all that supplication, prayer, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Notice all the different kinds of prayers. Okay, why? Because God has a purpose, and that purpose is found in Matthew, or sorry, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 8, where it says, I desire, therefore, God speaking, I desire, therefore, that the men may pray everywhere. Basically what God is saying is here, there's a variety of ways to pray, but my desire is you come to me and talk with me. You know, we know the sad story of Adam and Eve. They had, they had a relationship with God and all of a sudden they broke that relationship with God because of sin and then they went in. Hell. And remember when God came down as he, and the word of God says, as he usually did to commune with them. He couldn't find them. God knew exactly where they were. Okay, they were hidden because of sin and being ashamed of their sin. But what I like that picture is God created man for what? To have communion with him. And communion with him is not what we take on the first Sunday of the month. I'm not talking about that communion. I'm talking about communion with him, having a relationship with God. Talking with him, walking with him, walking in the stillness of the night, in the quietness of the garden, just spending time with our daddy. Being able to crawl up on his lap and talk with him from the heart. That is what we find that Paul is dealing with right here. You and I need to learn to pray. But there's another aspect of prayer. Look what it says there in our text, if you will. The next access. I put this. I put my glasses in the wrong pocket. See that? Um, it says this in verse 18. It says, "Praying always with all prayer and supplication." Notice what it says in the Spirit. The power of prayer. You know, the Word of God tells us that there is power in Jesus in uh, in the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter one, in verse eight, the the church was told, "Listen, you go back." You go back to Jerusalem and wait for the Holy Spirit. So when the Holy Spirit comes, the Holy Spirit will empower you to serve me. There's power in the Holy Spirit. Notice what it says in verse, uh, verse 8. But you, you shall receive power. That term power there is the term dynamite. We get our English word dynamite from that word power. And it's the idea of, of great explosion, great, you know, it's going to affect those around us. That's the power the Holy Spirit gives us. And it's interesting, in our text, here in, uh, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, we are told and made very clear that we need to be praying in 
the Spirit. So why is it that we're told in John chapter 14, in verses 13 and 14, and whatsoever you ask in my name? Now, doesn't that sound like a contradiction? Are we supposed to pray in the name of Jesus, or are we supposed to pray in the Holy Spirit? I submit to you that they're, they're two different things. I submit to you that, that praying in the Spirit is allowing the Spirit to take our prayers and take them before the throne of grace. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 26, we are told, likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our infirmities. Listen, we are weak people. Oh, you might be one of those guys who can go to the gym. You know, I go to the gym and I watch these, uh, these young men and women who, who stand over. I get on the elliptical, you know, and I'm just walking and I, I walk very slow. You know, I just take my time. I have earbuds in my ears and I listen to a book and I'm reading a book. But I, I watch people, okay? And there's these people against the wall where they have the weights. And, and you know, they, 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 they put the, you know, there's, there's, there's the, the stack of weights and they put that little, little, you know, thing that slides out. I don't even know the terms. I'm not a, I, I don't go to the gym very much, obviously, you can tell. Okay, but I, I, take, I take the little knob and I, you know, they put it way down at the bottom and they're lifting these weights. And, and you can tell, men or women, you know, they, they have these muscles. They're people you don't want to, um, you don't want to um, meet in a dark alley somewhere. Okay, you don't want to meet them in a dark alley. But the Word of God says basically we are weak. You might be one of those guys, one of those people who can lift 250 pounds. You can, you, you know, you can throw things around, and, and that, that, that's great. But even those people are weak. The Word of God says there's a weakness in us. And that comes from sin. And the Word of God says because of my sin, I cannot communicate with God properly. And it's because of the Holy Spirit that I can go and I can find that the, that, that the Spirit... Notice what it says here. For we do not know what we should even ask. Okay? For as, ask as we ought. But the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us. And I know what you're thinking. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Jesus says He's sitting at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us. Yes, the, the, the Jesus does that, but also the Spirit does that. The Spirit is making intercession. The power we have in prayer is the power that the Holy Spirit takes when I say. Why? Because I'm in, 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 my, in my weakness, I'm going to ask for things that, you know, that, that I ought not to be asking for. Or I'm going to ask for it the wrong way. Or I'm going to have the, the, sometimes the wrong motive in my heart. But God knows the intent. And he's going to take that. Or the Holy Spirit knows the intent. And he's going to take that before the throne of grace. And God's going to answer my prayer. That's the promise we have. And that's the power we find here in these verses. It's interesting, there's another, uh, there's another aspect of this prayer that, the, that Paul tells, uh, tells the, the, the Christians at Ephesus. He says, now listen, you need to pray always, and you need to pray with the variety of prayers, prayer and supplication, the general and the specific. He says, you, you need to pray in the Spirit, being watchful. You know, there's a warning here, be watchful, be alert, be awake. I told my wife I was going to say this, she said I probably shouldn't have. Um, but I think this is the this is one of the early instances of wokeness. Why? Because David says, "I woke and I saw God." The, the the point that I'm making here today is this: Okay, we as God's children have to learn to wake up. The Word of God makes it very clear: Watch and pray. And when you watch and pray, you will not enter into temptation. That's what this verse is saying. We're, uh, we're, told, uh, we're told in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 6, we're told, therefore, let us not sleep as others do. But let us be awake. Let us watch and be sober. You know, this idea of being awake for God. You know, we need to wake up. You know, it's time for us to recognize that Jesus Christ is coming back soon. And if he's coming back soon, we better be ready. 
We better wake up and start doing what he's asked us to do. Why? Because one day we're going to stand before the throne of, of grace, Jesus Christ, the throne of Christ, the Bema Seat. And we're going to, he's going to examine us as believers. He's going to examine us, not for our sin, because that sin has already been washed at the, at the cross of Jesus Christ, but he's going to look at the works we have done. He's going to look if, we, if we've been faithful to him. He's going to look and see what, what you know, and, and he's going to judge us for that. People say, well, there's no crying in heaven. And I believe there's no crying in heaven. But I believe before we get there, when we stand before the, the being the seat of Christ, we're going to feel about this big. You know, we're going to feel total shame because we didn't do what God wants us to do many times. And the Word of God tells us, and here Paul says, listen, folks, you need to wake up and you need to be ready. Why? Because the adversary, as a, as a roaring lion, is ready to devour you if you're not going to pay attention. I think it's on the... On the uh, Atlantic City Expressway, there's some signs on the Atlantic City Expressway that says, um, that says uh, something like, be alert, be awake, or be, be alert, be awake, and be alive. Okay? And, and that's true in our Christian life. We need to make sure that we're paying attention. Why? Because the enemy is going to attack, and the enemy is ready to attack. My friends, this is the exact thing that Paul's talking about. We are fighting not a flesh and blood. We are fighting a spiritual battle. Notice what it says in verse 12 of, uh, of uh, Ephesians chapter 6. We do not wrestle. We do not fight. We do not have war with flesh and blood. But against principalities. Against the devil is what he's talking about. We need to wake up, folks. Because I think so often, you know, there's a, my, my grandson laughs at me on a regular basis anymore. He's turned three and he thinks pop-up's funny. Okay. And he laughs at me because we'll put a show on for him on TV. And I'll sit down on my recliner. And as soon as that show comes on, I'm sound asleep. You know, one of those kids lullaby shows, you know, plays music, plays, you know, and I'm... Oh, I just I sound asleep. And, and Logan thinks that's funny. Mom, shh, I'm sleeping. I'm sleeping. You know, we fall asleep very easily. Satan knows what, what lullabies to play so that our attention is taken away and our focus is taken away off the heavenly thing. You know, the Word of God says, listen, friends, if we're going to stand against the wiles of the devil, that ought not to happen. And you know something? I'm guilty of it. You know, that's not just the problem you have. And you know, if you're sitting here today and you says, well, I'm not guilty of that, be careful of pride because fall comes after pride. Because I can guarantee you we all struggle with it. Well, Pastor, you know, I'm, I'm 150 years old and I haven't had that struggle in 140 years. Yes, you have. Don't lie. We all have. Why? Because it's part of the human nature. And you know something? The Word of God says, listen folks, be alert. Stay alert. Make sure you, as a child of God, you're always ready. You're always, you're always standing firm. You have those, those shoes on. We looked at how the shoes had spikes on the bottom of it so you could stand your ground. I mentioned that the Roman soldiers had that, that little square of six by six that they had to stand in and that no matter what, they weren't going to move. They were going to stand there with their shield. They were going to be ready for any attack that came. They were going to be watchful. They were going to be ready. And that's what Paul's talking about. That is what the prayer life is all about. Giving us that power to do what we ought to do. It goes on Romans chapter 13 verse 11 says, and do this knowing that the time uh, that, uh, knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep for now our, uh, for, for now our salvation is, ne is nearer than when we first believed. You know, it's not saying that we're working on our salvation. It's saying that the day Jesus Christ is coming, is coming closer. And the attacks are getting stronger and stronger. The next thing is perseverance in prayer. And notice, we talked about perseverance this morning in Sunday school. But notice what it says. It says, with all perseverance and supplication. 
I'm not going to spend much time looking at perseverance, but we have the idea here. Uh, most of us know that this idea is that we keep on doing it no matter what. Listen, um, Acts chapter 12. Go with me over to Acts chapter 12. I'll give you an example of perseverance. Acts chapter 12. Perseverance means that when we're not feeling good, we still pray. When we're not, uh, when, when things are going our way, we still pray. When things are going our way, we still pray. Why? Because we pray always. In Acts chapter 12, we find the story of Peter being thrown in, in jail. Herod, uh, Herod, the king, stretched out his hand and harassed some of the church, we're told in verse 1. In verse 2, we're told that king, uh, then he killed James, the brother of uh, of, of John with the sword, that James the Apostle was killed with the sword. And, uh, and notice what it says, and because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also, and it was during the days of unleavened bread. And so Peter now is thrown into jail, and it's interesting what the Word of God tells us in verse 4. It says, so when he... Uh, he had arrested him, he put him in jail and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep them intending to bring him before the people uh, after pa Passover. Peter was therefore kept in prison in verse 5, but notice what it says, but constant prayer, constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. Constant prayer. Well, Pastor, isn't that uh, persistent? Is that, is that persistent? Yes. <coughs> that's persistence. Um, that's what we're talking about. It's always talking. Same with, same with always. Remember, it's that, that same principle. But what I like about the story is God comes down, He delivers, He answers prayer. And God comes down and He takes the chains off of Peter and He opens the door and He says to Peter, Go out. And Peter thinks he's asleep until he gets outside the gates. He realizes, he realizes this isn't a dream. And so he goes to where the house is meeting, at Mary's house, and he starts knocking on the door. So the little servant girl, while the church is still praying, and this is in the middle of the night, you know, they, they didn't have a prayer meeting that, that people said after an hour, you know, Pastor, it's time to go home. They were praying, and they prayed, and they prayed, and they prayed some more, and they were still praying in the middle of the night when Peter got there, and he's knocking on the door, and Rhoda, Rhoda, Rhoda came to the door and said, and, and looks out the door and sees Peter, and she's all amazed that Peter is at the door, runs in, and tells everybody, leaves Peter outside, by the way. Peter's still knocking on the door. Leaves Peter outside. He wrote, she runs in and says, Hey folks, hey folks, you can stop praying now. Peter's at the door. And the word of God says that they looked at him and said, You're crazy, he's in jail. He's in jail. No, no, he's at the door. Come and see. And the word of God says that they came to the door and saw and they thought that he was a ghost. They still didn't believe. You know, but through it all, they prayed, is what my point is. No matter how tough it got, no matter how late it got, they continued and persisted in prayer. You know, I know in Sunday school, people ask me, well, how do we know when to stop praying? And I don't know that answer. But there are times we have to just continue praying, and continue praying, and continue praying. But guess what? When Peter's at the door, and he's knocking to come in, let him in, and stop praying, your, your prayers are answered. Okay, you can stop at that point. But you know, there has to be this, this understanding. And then there's a, there's, a, there's a final thing we find in this text that's the object of prayer. And notice what it says in verse, uh, verse 18. It says, for all the same. You know, I think it's amazing that Paul doesn't say, pray for me. You might say, wait a minute, wait, wait a minute, Pastor, he does. In verses 19 and 20, he prays, He says, pray for me. No, in 19 and 20, he gives an example on how to pray for all the saints. And he uses himself as an example. But, but here, he says, pray for all the saints. You know, I find it amazing. He didn't pray for souls to be saved. He didn't say, listen, we go to battle, pray that souls be saved. No, he says, pray for the saints. Why? Because it's the saints who are doing the battle. It's the saints that are winning souls. It's the saints that have to, have to carry the banner of Jesus Christ. It's the saints who are on the front line. It's the saints who are, who are experiencing the, 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 the fiery darts of the devil. It's the saints who are experiencing the wiles of the devil. It's the saints. And Paul says, listen, as you pray, and you pray always, and you pray co consistently, and you pray with power, and you pray with all these ways, he says, pray for the body of Christ. And then he gives an example. 
and that example. And notice what Paul, what Paul says. Paul never asked them to pray for him to get out of jail. He was written from he was, he was writing this from jail. He didn't say, pray for me that I would get out of jail. He says, no, pray that I be found faithful in, in preaching the word of God. And that I would be bold in what I say. That I would not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen, God has placed you in areas. It might be, it might be an area at work. It might be, it might be at a, you know, for some of you uh, who, who are who are overworked at this point, you know, you. It might be amongst friends at a at a at a at a, at a senior place. It might be, you know, Uber driver. I know we have at least one Uber driver here. It might be in the in the Uber, you know, while you're driving. It might be, you know, wherever it is. God has placed you in a situation where God wants you to be faithful and to demonstrate Jesus Christ in all that you do, in all that you say, in every way you live. That's what he expects. And Paul says, listen folks, pray for one another that you be found faithful in doing what God's called you to do. Not that you be removed from that situation. Pastor, I'm going to the doctor this week. Fine. I'm not going to pray that the doctor appointment gets canceled, that you get healed, I'm going to pray that you be found faithful as you stand before the doctor. That's what God wants. Paul says, put on the whole armor of God, pick up the sword of the Spirit, and pray. My friends, that's what we need to do if we're going to be victorious. We need to pray. Are you praying? You have a relationship with God that you can go to Him in prayer. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you can't go to Him in prayer. Why? Because the Word of God says He won't even hear you unless you first ask for forgiveness of sin. My friends, how's your prayer life for me? Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you, Lord, for this message. Thank you for this uh, for the picture that we have here. And Lord, I ask that, Lord, you, uh, in your... Um, in your greatness and in your power, you enable us to be people of prayer. Minister to us, guide us, and direct us. Lord, I pray that, Lord, uh, you would just m motivate us to be more consistent in our prayer. I do thank you. Before I say amen, I want to ask you this question. How's your prayer life today? Is your focus on the right place? Are you praying as consistently as you ought to? Some of you would say, yes, we are, Pastor. Praise the Lord for that. But maybe I'm, I'm sure there's some of you, and I know many times I fail in this area, but many of you might not be praying the way you should. As the Lord convicted your heart this morning, would you be willing to say, Pastor, pray for me. I know that my prayer life needs to be better. I know I need to be more consistent. I need to be more faithful. Would you just raise your hand? Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lord, I thank you for the hands that went up. And I ask, Lord, that you challenge our hearts today. We thank you in Christ Jesus' name. Amen.